One of my favorite things to do is to watch other guitar YouTube channels. When I was in London recently, I made a pilgrimage out to Stonehenge. Actually, my wife and kids went to Stonehenge. And I went about 20 miles further, and I got to interview Dan and Mick from that pedal show, which is a channel I love to watch and I've watched for years. Here's my interview. Thank you for inviting me here, by the Night. way. Are you it's kidding? A, They're 28 a... miles from Stonehenge. And my wife was like, I want to go to Stonehenge. And I said, are you serious? And she's like, yeah. What do, you, what do you mean? Am I serious? And she hasn't seen Spinal Tap. So we've got a great Stonehenge story. I want to hear it. Okay. So wait, introduce yourselves and tell people kind of how you guys got into doing this. Okay. Um, I'm Dan, uh, Daniel Steinhardt. Um, my name's Mick, Mick Taylor. Uh, I was an editor of a magazine, a guitar magazine. Uh, so my world was guitar magazines until magazines started to drop off a little bit. We come online. Dan. Uh, I own a company called The Gig Rig, and we've been making switching systems and power supplies and pedal boards for rock stars um, and all the lovely people. Mick and I have been good friends for a long time, and we were... We wanted to go into a room and make noise, is the truth of the matter. Yeah, yeah. And, and whenever, whenever we got together, the conversation always ended up about gear. Yep. And it was, I've, you know, I've, I, I love gear. And I, I love the potential that it provides. Mm -hmm. And we kind of clicked on this thing. And, we, we, you know, I think we'd been, I'd asked Mick to come on board to, to give me a hand because I didn't know any stuff about business. I'm, you know, guitar player. And, and we just talked about gear all the time. Okay. And Mick's like, well, let's just, why don't we just film this? Because I've seen, um, I'd done a, a few little videos before, but I was terrible at it. Then one day Mick showed me a video that he made and it was beautiful. <laughs> and the lighting and the sound, I'm just like, how do you even do that? <laughs> and so we got in the cupboard uh, seven years ago and made our first uh, video. So did you think though that this was going to be a thing that you guys were going to be YouTubers? It's kind of strange, right? Yeah, yeah. I get you must talk to people who are slightly uncomfortable with the term because you never think of yourself as that, right? Even though that's what you are and that's 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 the way it's evolved. But, you know, Dan and I have been in bands our whole lives. Dan, you know, makes this thing for lots of professional musicians. I've been a magazine journalist and it just kind of took flight. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the way that it took flight for you like that, it took flight for us kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> a bit more gently. Um, but I, I have to say, uh, you know, we must off the cap to Lee Anderton and Chappers, mm -hmm. um, to, I don't know, I guess Mike Hermans, to Gear Man Dude, to who else was around? Uh, Andy, Andy Demos. Demos. Andy Martin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they were the trailblazers. In yeah, the OGs. Yeah, yeah absolutely. and they showed, us, they showed us that it was possible. Phil X. Yeah, yeah, yeah Phil. Fred Americana. That's right. Those, I, I was... I used to watch those videos religiously because he's amazing. He texted yeah. me this morning. Yeah, nice. um, when done right, those videos, you could see the benefit mm. that they would have to players who wanted to understand. There was, I think for me, there was a, so much misinformation um, floating around on gear forums and stuff. And when, when someone puts a, across a piece of information eloquently and, and succinctly on a YouTube video, Man, it cuts through all that stuff. This is really interesting that you mentioned this. So Tim Pierce and Phil X are two of my dear friends. Okay? Tim Pierce. And Tim oh, was one of the... Yes. So I watched both of those guys early yeah, on. Yeah. Now, you make a great point about this, Dan, is that in the past, I used to go on these gear forums. I won't say ones, but mm -hmm. more pro audio ones. I'm a mm -hmm. music producer and, you know, and you'd read stuff and you'd say, well, none of that's true. These people don't use this gear. These people that are talking about it have never used these pieces of gear. They're right. just basic, what I call repeaters. So, yeah, yeah. But then with YouTube, when you're on YouTube, you actually hear the things, you see them. Mm -hmm. So you can make up your own mind sure. how you like the sound. If they're well recorded, you guys, this yeah. is what I love about what you do. And, and on pro YouTube channels here that are doing professional audio recording of guitars, guitar sounds and things like that, with real microphones placed properly, mic pre's and things like that, yeah. you can hear them yourself and Absolutely. make up your own informed decision mm -hmm. as to how things sound. And I think it's actually, well, it's kind of been to the detriment of those old forums yeah. that don't really have any meaning anymore because of YouTube, which I think is, gr I think it's great yeah. because you, you really, really can experience things that you never would have gotten a chance to hear before, especially, you know, 
maybe pedals that are uh, out of date or something that mm-hmm. aren't made anymore or guitar, guitar amps for me that I that I own you know I've got a Laney clip uh, with a with a 71 cabinet 412 Laney cabinet with fanes in it now you never see these things right. they're rare to find right that are in good working condition that you can hear and I can put you know a, an SM57 on it and a 421 and put it through two Neve mic pre's and you know get Perfect mic placement, blend the two things together into one sound. This is what a Laney clip or what this Laney clip sounds yeah. like. And other than that, when do you actually hear the things properly recorded? Yeah, totally. To to know what Tony Iommi, if he played one, what it would have sounded like, you know, mm. like what the a- actual things sound like. So this is what is great about what you guys do demonstrating these things. There's a pedal. So when I came in, I'm talking a lot here. I don't like to talk a lot when I'm <laughs> interviewing people, but I asked them, hey, have you heard of this pedal? And I heard of this fuzz pedal yesterday. I was watching one of Tom Bukovac's videos and he mentioned it. And I said, I've never even heard of this pedal. Well, Tom said, what's the best selling pedal? And he was in some pedal shop Mm -hmm. in Nashville. And they said, oh, this fuzz pedal. I was like, I've never even heard of this. And I'm usually on, (laughs) I usually know the stuff that's coming out. And then uh, I asked them about it and they were like, oh, it's right here. Of course it is. Of course it is. You should meet Jesse. He's a he's a great dude. He um, used to play in a band in the UK called The Hoax. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and fantastic. they they were Jesse. I hope none of this is uh, sounds pejorative because it's not meant in this way. Um, <laughs> kind of SRV and Hendrix and that kind of revivalists, if you like. And they did a fantastic job of it. Mm. You know, cranked amps, really um, authentic gear, and great players. Great, great, great players. And yeah. Jesse's since gone on, and he he makes a lot of good stuff. I think yeah. he lives in the US, doesn't he now? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. So he's in the US somewhere. Jesse Davey, for yeah. those of you who don't know. So that was one of the first things we discussed was you know, we're talking about the forums. Yeah. And whenever I go on the forums, it was it would be oh, this pedal sounds greasy and glassy and but it's got and it's got a fat bottom end while still retaining a streamlined mid range. It's like What does it like, mean? It, well, and the thing is, it's like <laughs> the, one of the first things we said is this has no sound. It has no sound. It reacts to what goes into it. And then what comes out of it. Yes. You know, that reacts to what goes into it. Yes. You know? So it's part of a chain. And if you're going to describe something, the sound you get, you've got to tell people what guitar you're using. You've got to That's tell people right. what amp you're using. Yeah. You know, how loud are you playing? And obviously, you know, things like tube screamers and, you know, we can talk about where they're um, where they push the mids and that sort of stuff. And so if we're talking about EQ curves and things, yeah, great. But it was just one of those things that always tickled me when, it, you know, when you see that people describe pedals with no mention of guitars and amps that they were using. Yeah, we don't, I think we've done our share of that as well. We've been guilty of that, if, if guilty is the right word. But <laughs> I still don't yeah, know yeah. what this pedal sounds like. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll plug it in in a sec if you want. But one thing we've become increasingly passionate about is this whole idea of better and worse and best. And just trying to put it over that if you like the sound and that's it right. makes you want to play yeah. and it inspires you, that's the that's the best thing for you. And it doesn't need to be the best thing that the internet says or the latest boutique thing that costs whatever and you have to wait two years to get. It's not about that. We're very passionate about that. You know, it's just the most important thing is you pick up a guitar and play and yeah. you feel inspired to play because we also passionately believe that a good tone or a tone that's good to you will make you play better and make you connect. Yeah. Because that's what we're about. It's connection through music that makes that emotional connection for humans who are listening. And or even though we have this thing called that pedal show and we have this crazy room full of gear, that's what we're interested in. Totally. Really. It, that that experience has been transformative for both of us. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure for you, you as well. There's the reason that we do this is because at some point, music lit something in us. You know, th- th- we, we talk to people all the time, people who come to our experience days who've never plugged into a loud app, never experienced what it's like just to go. And it I changed my life when I was a kid, the first time I plugged into a loud app. It's incredible. And, you know, uh, so that is, our motivation is to help people truly connect because we understand the power that that has. If, if, if what you, if music is in you, having that connection, getting rid of the stuff and just helping that connection so that you can say something. And that's that's it. And whether that's with a bad monkey or a, um, a CXM 1978, you know, 800 pound reverb pedal, that's, that's 
irrelevant. It's like you 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 do the work, you find the gear that you like, and that then that helps you be you. Well, if I want to know what a pedal sounds, I'll type in that pedal show, and I will Let's see. <laughs> look up to see if you've done a video on a particular pedal. Right. Because instead, because I know when Mick was showing me this reverb pedal here, he's playing minor eleven voicings, and he's and he plays stuff that is going to sound great with a clean sound with the stereo, you know, miking and everything. It sounds amazing in the room. He knows when, when you talk about how does it make you feel? How does it make you play? People mm. play better when they like their sound. Also, when you're demonstrating a pedal, if you have the, the experience, you know how to make this pedal sound great by the types of things that you play that will sound great through that and bring those things out. You're not just playing straight you know, GCD, yeah. you're playing these beautiful, more intricate voicings that really bring out the ambience uh, will will accentuate and make sound even more beautiful. Got to shout Pete Thorne and Tim Pierce for being masters of that. That's right. Yeah. For understanding that craft so perfectly well. And that, and I love the way Pete describes it, which is he'll just plug a pedal in and he'll play it for a bit and it'll take him somewhere and he'll let that idea develop. Yeah. And that it's just, it's magic because... I guess most of us, when you're less experienced, you can play a few things maybe, and you, you sort of try and impart that on the gear. Whereas you get a few more years down the road, a few more notes under your belt, and you can let the gear do what it, what it brings well, out of you. And it's an interesting, it's a different uh, experience. I, think. I, t I would usually buy stuff that I hear my friends demo. If I hear Pete demoing something, I'll yeah. call him and I'll say, tell, you know, tell me about this. Yeah. When Tim plays something, I'll be like, why don't I why don't I have that? Mm. <laughs> and, and Tim's like, Oh, I've, I've got 15 of them. <laughs> like, like what? This is the way that I find out about new gears oh. by going, watching my, the YouTube channels that I watch, and especially at me being a guitar player and everything and being a recording engineer. I know I don't make this kind of content on my channel very often, but I used to, I have 1200 videos. I have a lot of recording videos way back seven years ago when I started. And I'm really passionate about that. And mm. I love sounds mm. and I love, guitar sounds. I love all different types of, of sounds, but um, these, the ability to hear them is, that's, a, that's to me is the best thing about, yeah. about YouTube. And I love channels that you guys deal with pedals and, uh, and play guitar. And I, and I know that I'm going to get a great demonstration of what the things are going to sound like. That's very kind. Um, some, some days are better than others, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, again, it's like none of that stuff, you know, if we get a new pedal in that we're excited to try, mm -hmm. um, and there's, and let's be honest, there's some absolutely amazing gear out there at the moment. Yes. Uh, more, than, more than there ever has been. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah, on absolutely. Scale. Yeah, so yeah. we are spoiled for choice. Yeah. You know? But it's funny that every now and then we will just take a step back and go, oh, haven't played the hotcake for a while. Let's just put that back on. Oh yeah, that's right. That thing is amazing. <laughs> you know, uh, let you know. I'll pull out the old Space Echo every now and then and stick it in. It's like it still has something that nothing else has got. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think it's important because I still we are surrounded by gear and pedals. I I terrified to think how many pedals we actually have here, but I still get excited about a new pedal turning up. You know. There's always been great gear and that excitement can actually, certainly for me, I'm a very excitable person. <laughs> it can in you, mate. It yeah. can in me. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll get really fizzy about stuff, but I've got to give myself a few days and, and let that wear off and then come back to it, you know. Um, I'm the opposite. Right. I'll get a new pedal out. I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> and then a week later, this is the best thing I've ever heard. But we, we, we do... One of, we do uh, a thing called experience days here. So we'll get six uh, people in, do it once a month. And they come in, spend the day. And it might be someone who's never plugged in a loud amp. You mentioned it earlier. Or just a ton, ton of stuff they may never have done before. But the first thing we do is we take that deluxe reverb and we plug in a Les Paul. And we put it on three, on five, on seven, and on ten and crank it. And anyone that wants to have a play can have a play. And just say, look, for all of this... That's probably what most of us are after most of the time. Right. Mm. And it's important to just ground that and remember yeah. that so many records, I mean, you know this better than anyone, so many records you've heard has been exactly that, just a cranked amp, a decent mic, a decent mic pre, mm. and someone who knows how to capture that sound and knows how to play. That's, that's where we start. You know, some of my favorite 
think questions that I've asked in interviews when I, Peter Frampton is one of the first people I interviewed back in 2018. Mm -hmm. And I asked Peter about his rig back in the seventies and, and it was very complicated actually, even yeah, though there was yeah, only a few yeah. pedals, yeah. but yeah. you know, he had his, his, his uh, talk box going through one Marshall. He mm -hmm. had his, uh, he had the Benson Echo Rat. He had a phase 90, I think he had, uh, you know, he was, it was, it was a really sophisticated rig yeah. though. Yeah. That, for back then, sure. you know, and, and one of the most really be, creative yeah, yeah. with the Leslie, yeah. you know, all going out all the time mm -hmm. and and absolutely beautiful guitar sounds that he would get yeah. out of that. And and you had these massive things that you'd have to bring around with you. I yeah, mean, yeah. we're talking about moving a Leslie cabinet just for that, sure. just to be that creative and to go for those sounds. Like, yeah. you yeah. know, and nowadays it's you have your choice of every anything yeah. and it's so easy to do yeah. really but the tools are available aren't they and yeah. the stuff like um the the routing options for signal paths the uh, noise reduction all that kind of stuff because yeah. he would have been taking something that had been crafted very carefully in the studio presumably yeah and trying to take that on the road at 200 watts or yeah. 20000 watts or right. whatever you know that this and and I Things like it would yep. have cost you a hundred thousand dollars twenty five years ago right. to get that level of signal routing and all of mm. that. So, and I do, I, I've often, I don't know if this ever comes up in your in your interviews, Rick, but having that level of choice gives us the option paralysis. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And the idea sometimes can get lost in in that. Whereas that simple, well, let's see what we can do with a Les Paul and a Deluxe Reverb. Yeah. Somewhere in there has to be some happy ground. Uh, you know, I don't need. You know, look at this. It's ridiculous. This is this. These boards are an experiment at the moment. It's utterly ridiculous because you get lost in. <laughs> but this is the gr the time that we live in now. Yeah, right. It's not just pedals. It's amplifiers. Mm. It's microphones. It's mic pre's. Yeah. Everything's been miniaturized. Uh, you know, there's digital recording rigs that you use that, uh, you know, you don't have. I have a 24, I have a two inch 24 track in my studio that I yes, like to do. use yes, come when on. I, when I can have it, you know, have time to use it. I love to turn on. There's right. nothing like it. There is nothing like it. Right. Right. In all your years and with all your experience and you yeah. go to tape, it's like it oh, does dear. something. <laughs> that, right. You're right. So, I mean, we've got to a point that we don't use plugins at all anymore when, when we're recording guitars. We just got a couple of nice pre's and we... There's a couple of rooms, uh, room mics at the back and just a, you know, general mix of those. So you get a, a sort of sense of the room. And, you know, obviously there are amazing plugins out there, but we just got to a point. It's like every time we added a plugin, it just took something away. And yeah. so we and, yeah. ended up simplifying even like that to get to the, you know. Yeah, we, you get it right at source. You put yeah. the mic in the right place. Decent mic pre. We also run everything through the analog desk, which just helps a little bit with a very tiny bit of subtle EQ if we need yeah. it. But no post. Um, I mean, you wouldn't do that if you were making a record, but to capture a guitar sound in a room, it's it's fine. Maybe I, you would do that if you were making a record. Well, it's interesting because <laughs> I have all the digital, you know, I have the computer-based modelers. I have mm -hmm. the rack modelers and everything. Yeah. But for me, the quickest way to get a sound is to just oh, turn on a, ca you know, like plug in an amp and put on put a mic or two on a cabinet and through some mic breeze and you're up and running in, yeah, in yeah. two minutes. Yeah. And if it's not the right sound, he's like, I'll oh, pull that head off. Let's put this one. And I just put stack them up in my control room. Nice. And I've got, usually we'll have four, four twelves if I'm using a, a head in the control room and I'll put mics on all of them and I can just switch out the, the speaker cables from them and, and, you know, go, go between sounds in like one minute. Yeah. That's way faster than okay, pushing buttons here. And oh, what if I do this? Oh, I'm going to go on this mic model, microphone model or that microphone model. It's like, well, I have the real thing. So I'll just, yeah, yeah. it's far yeah. faster to do it or to tweak the pedals. Oh, you know, it's muddy in the front end. Oh, I'll just put a little distortion pedal that'll high pass it before, before I go in there and things like that. These are all things that I've, when I produced, I produced mainly metal bands, you know, beginning in the, in the late nineties, because that's the music that was popular. Right. Even though I'm going to be 61 in a couple of weeks, then people would be coming in with lower and lower tuned guitars and extended range instruments. And it's like, well, they, you put those through, distortion and you have to high pass them mm. because the front end of the yeah. amps it, it just just become super muddy sure. to tighten the mid-range and so i would start doing things where i'd either use an eq before it or put a distortion pedal with with almost no gain on it yeah. and it would high pass the guitar mm. and then it would say it would would have the right kind of eq curve on it going mm. into the amp 
that would make it have a, a full sound and a, and a, and a nice tight mid range and mm. stuff. So well, guys used to use a tube screamer for that, didn't they? And that's so, right. Yeah. 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 For that exact that's job. why they came up with the, you know, Jubilees and things like that is yeah. to, is for that reason. But the tube screamer was like a very common thing mm. to use in front of the amp to tighten up the, tighten up the mid range. It was interesting. I did a, a video with Dave Friedman and he said, um, if you use lighter strings, because I use eights on my guitar. I mean, my guitars have different, some might have nines, some have tens. I use 13s on my acoustic. So, but he said, you know, lighter strings have less bass and will have yeah. a tighter mid range. And he said, you should make that video. So I was like, that's a great idea. So I did this thing where we went and we did 11s to 10s to nines yeah, yeah. to eights and everything. And, and it's true. He, and because he said, he goes, Eddie Van Halen used Fender Bullets, the uh, nine through 40. Right. right. So it's kind of like a hybrid. You figure a, a nine gauge goes to 42 and eight gauge goes to 38. Mm -hmm. And then he's tuned down a half step or wherever he was tuned. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, and so his sound would be was tighter because of that. It was tighter than what it would have been if you used tens, 10 through 46, for example. And I was just like, oh, that's great. That would be a great video. And that actually turned out to be a really cool video idea is to mm. do that. But but knowing that. To me, though, just finding those things out and just kind of doing those back-to-back -back ABs, I think, is fascinating. Yeah, they are. It's 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 a big part of the the because it's called that pedal show, right? But what we're trying to get across is that all of those things do matter. Yeah, every single aspect of your ecosystem tonally makes a difference, and it might be that you could tighten things up with a different string gauge, or you could do it with an EQ pedal, or a different distortion pedal, or you could change the EQ in your amp, and the result isn't the same. Right, and I suppose having the confidence to try those things and, and get into it without driving yourself crazy. Yeah. Because well, you, you're two weeks in going, I've got eight tube screamers here and I can't decide which one's best. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's a dangerous place to be. I but think. where do you go, guys, when you're, do you adjust the pedal first? Do you adjust the amp? Do you move the mic? Do you change the EQ and the mic pre? You know, it's, it can be anything, really. Sure. Yeah, sure. simplest thing first, I would say. So yeah. my recording wise, always mic. Get them get the sound in the room first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get the mic placed right mm -hmm. things like that. But but play get the sound to where it inspires you. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. 100%. That's what you were that's yeah. what you guys are saying. 100%. Exactly that. And we, we you know, Dan and I, we probably play a bit louder than we should in here. And we're 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 passionate fans of of volume, not for volume's sake, but for the dynamic that it offers. Yes. yes. So you can get light and shade. And you know, it might only be twelve bars in the night where you're fully you know, hammering, but having that depth of uh, the, the access to volume just gives you dynamic from, from the guitar yeah. through the whole rig. Understanding that and that dynamic relationship and the way the speaker comes, you know, back through you, back through the pickups, creates all that extra harmonic information um, is something that I think is is lost in the in the silent and digital environment. And I think some people are forgetting it, forgetting how inspiring it can be. Now, yeah, we absolutely. get all the practicality arguments. Yep. And they're valid. I, I remember. When people didn't have money to pay roadies. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> my, my first car when I was, I think I was 18, and it was a little um, little hatchback. And I was going down to buy my first 412, mm -hmm. my first Marshall. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I, I can only buy this if it fits in the car. Yeah. And, you know, three door, I opened the thing, I ripped the back seat out. And I squeeze the four by twelve in, and I get in, and I'm on the steering wheel like this, and I'm going, "It fits, <laughs> brilliant!" And I was away because I was because I'd, I'd heard it. It's like I that's it. I have to have a four twelve. Do you remember when you were young enough to carry a four twelve up a flight of stairs, Dan? Uh, without serious injury? Yeah, yeah. No, no, the mind's going as well. Um, yeah, but that was. I've <laughs> never complained about loading gear. Yeah, you know, because if this it's like you know you, all the bands used to go and see that were so inspiring and. Right, we went and saw Joe Bonamassa at the Royal Albert Hall. Mm -hmm. Joe's got a lot of gear. Joe's got a lot of gear. <laughs> and he had... And he hauls it everywhere. He hauls it everywhere. Yeah. He had three dumbbells. Not just his gear, by the way, but the the PA and everything, like the whole rig. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The three dumbbells. Uh, two tweeds. Uh, was it two tweeds. Two silver GBLs yeah. with a 412 EV and a ro rotating speaker. Yeah, and extra, you know, that's all behind, extra fallback just for the guitar You did say well. three dumbbells. Three dumbbells. Yeah. Three dumbbells. <laughs> And he was 116 dB on stage. Okay. Right? Now, I was sat. He was very generous and gave us really great seats right in front, roll out the hole. And I was a little nervous thinking, because we were on stage to sound check and it was powerful. Yeah. At no point was it unpleasant. 
to listen to. I mean, I'm far from it. It was incredible. But what that volume enabled him to do, I never forget this. One, one solo in the, in the night, the band stopped, and he basically had the volume rolled off in his guitar. Yeah. And you could hear him acoustically throughout the, the whole of the Royal Albert Hall. Yeah. And everyone is gripped. Then for the next 10 minutes, he starts to build and build because he's got somewhere to go. And at the end of the 10 minutes, the whole crowd is on their feet, you know, and just, it was just the most extraordinary thing. And that's what that volume gave him. It gave him the potential to just build and lift this thing up to this incredible crescendo. But at no point was anyone going, yeah, that's great, Joe. It's a little bit loud. It was just, it was. Yeah, because he knows how to handle it. Yeah, totally. He knows how to build that dynamic in, that light and shade by using that volume. It's not just about, okay, here we go, and trying to t rip everyone's heads off. It's interesting. When I when I uh, interviewed Pat Metheny, he's, he talked about he never plays, and which is true, you can tell, he never plays two notes, the same dynamic back yeah. to back, never does. Al Di Miola, when you know, Al's playing, and Al's so rhythmic and mm. so dynamic mm. with his playing. You know, this just, without even doing anything with the sound, just playing on the guitar. Mm. And and uh, and so many guys would use their volume control and back back it off so it's not quite hitting the hitting the amp as hard. And that's like a big thing, not running your... You know, people ask me, Rick, are you do you have your volume on full all the time? I said, no, I change my volume yeah. all the time. Yeah. Depending on you know, and you got to play with dynamics so that it you actually build an intensity and, yeah. and it makes the amps re react differently. Yeah, when uh, the thing about the guitar is, um, when I was my old guitar teacher, um, we put together this like a four piece jazz ensemble and we'd we'd play pieces and it's like when you hear the horn section do it and they were so bang and so dynamic and the guitars tended to be really flat you know sort of lacking that it's like actually hearing the way a horn player approaches this and and you, and you hear it in so many in robin ford and you hear it in so many amazing dynamic guitar players language how they've taken that dynamic approach from horn players yeah you know? um yeah i think it's the result as well of, of the time of having to play loud because there was a time where there was no alternative that's true yeah no true <laughs> You had to play loud, and that because brings... the PA systems weren't, uh, it, they they just didn't have the power to, to. Uh, yeah. I mean, think about the Beatles when they, yeah, you know, they couldn't be heard. That's why they stopped playing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. If I were to say to you guys, now this is, you're gonna hate this question, but what's your minimum things that you would put on a pedal board, and what would they be? Right now, today, it's usually okay. It's usually yep. at least two gain pedals. Okay. One that's more gainy. Yeah. One that's less gainy and put the less gainy one after the more gainy one so that you've got a boost, you've got somewhere to go. Yep. And for the more gainy one, we'd probably choose something that didn't have a radical EQ shape. Mm. So something that was just a good distortion, what might that be? Oh God, there are so many <laughs> overdrive pedals. Or, or maybe even a fuzz, but a fuzz is kind of extreme. That's Maybe that's for later down the line. Yeah. But just a good all-round distortion pedal and then a decent cleaner overdrive so my favorite combination personally would be a clon type in that second position yeah because it's got a great eq shape as a boost yep and you can it's got loads of headroom um and the first would be something that emulates just a good fat tube overdrive so right i don't know oh god we've got so many so that would be the overdrive section yep and then down the line you can add to that i'll do my overdrive section i would because i play tellies into mattresses and boxes and, and things um i would tend to go with something flatter like a, a keely modded blues driver or a uh, light speed by Gurion. light speed yep something like that something that that isn't doesn't radically change even an odr1 actually because you can set yeah. that to be slightly flatter the yep. nobles oh yeah, yeah one's yeah, great yeah and then something like a, a tube boost something like a, a kingsley page that's been on my board forever and just is a phenomenal thing and by the combinations of those two, there's not a lot that I can't get. I would, where Mick would probably have a fuzz, I'd probably have a treble booster okay. in the front. Mm -hmm. Just because more treble is better. Yeah, Dan, tends, Dan <laughs> tends to like um, AC type amps that are a bit more pushed. Yeah. So if you hit that with too much full frequency, it can get mushy. Exactly what you right. were just yeah. saying That's about right. the... 
You yeah, know, it depends on what amplifier. If you're playing through a Fender style amp that has more yeah. of a scoop mid range versus a Vox style yeah. that has a more uh, focused, a pointed mid range, mm -hmm. you're going to do something different before the amp. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I tend to like the big headroom, more powerful 100 watt type amps, and you can do anything. That's why I, I have some people are like, why do you have so many 100 watt amps? It's like yeah. because you have a lot more yeah. variation with them. Yeah. Really. I mean, I have plenty of combos that are not in my shot and everything, but you see many 100 watt. <laughs> amplifiers in my just in my something studio. about that big transformer that yeah just seems to give and then we go what uh modulation delay mm -hmm. and maybe reverb if the amp doesn't have it yeah so i always go for um an electric mistress type flanger okay there's something about that really short delay time that i also you know it helps it projects so it's great for graphic clean parts but it's great for solos and I often use that instead of a boost. Um, that would be my, my modulation. Delay, something tapey. I, I like have, I'll, I'll generally have two delays on the board. And one is a, generally always tapey. The other one's always a DD3 type warm digital. There's a, a new delay by um, Otto. Otto mm -hmm. um, it's 12 bit. Um, yeah, it's thing. a lower bit sample sample rate, the, and that's the thing about these older delay pedals. Mm -hmm. I have the the original Boss or original, but the sample delay, the silver one, really the DS, old one. D D S two. Yes, it's, 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 there is yeah, one. and it's it's beautiful sound. It's, it's a lower bit rate. At uh, when you get into the higher bit rate. Uh, delay pedals and they they're and sometimes they can be too clean sounding yeah, yeah. but you're but you're saying that those that's why you'd like the the like a 12 bit delay yeah, for example uh, yeah i yeah. just and i and and the combination of you know one feeding into the other when you well. say a tapey explain that to people that don't know like a tape sounding yeah so i mean i will often there's the uh, take out uh, echo by um echo fix yep which is the which are, i i have one of those and, and they're fantastic just sounding. fantastic yeah and it's like a super clean version of the the space echo yeah trait. there's a roland space echo sat behind that marshall if you can't see it but and i <laughs> i love that sound Me it's too. it's amazing um yeah. now if i'm not going to haul one of those along to a gig uh memory man yep it's uh hard to beat yeah and but a combination of you know a memory man or a nice tape echo with a really cool sound digital delay and Put them together and it's like love it yeah yeah that's about it isn't it and then it's just it's variations on that we both massive fans of tremolo mm -hmm. either in love harmonic tremolo. or amplitude form amplitude form with two two overdrives a delay so you could either do like a short doubling delay or a slap back or something longer yeah something wobbly we, we call modulation pedals pedals wobbly pedal something that wobbles um you can you know i think you can cover most most things yeah and then once you get up to this kind of level it's just more of that so it's just more gain stages more wobbly more delay more reverb yeah uh, there is a ring modulator down there as well which is a some folly that's happening at the moment you know i find <laughs> uh, when i put, plug in some of my old pedals in, in the studio if i i have a mxr flanger i'm from rochester and mm -hmm. i was, I yeah. was uh, no way and mxr was based there and and so everybody had the distortion plus and they had the and the the um the flanger and the and the uh, phase ninety, and, but the flanger that was the first pedal I ever bought, MXR flanger back in seventy eight. I heard Van right. Halen. I was yeah. like, I'm buying this flanger. I still have it, and it's and it can be noisy. You know, it's yeah. an older pedal, yeah. but it's just, powered. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's hardwired, just like my Memory Man, which is has hardwired yeah, nice. that's thirty years old or yeah. whatever. I don't know how old it is. These pedals that can be noisy that that had the original, you know, what do you call this when they have the power cable coming out of those? old <laughs> uh, but but uh th things that i might not use in a live rig sure. because it's just too much unless you have some type of switching gating system or or you know digital yeah. switcher that i wouldn't use i'd play i'd use something cleaner mm -hmm. i mean when i just did the show here in london i brought three pedals i mean i've got all these things i was like hey i had bought a clon type pedal and i had a uh, i was going into ac30 and i had a just a dd the, the boss DDL3 or but I think that's what I can't can't remember Mike what was it that I used DD3 DD3 yeah probably a DD3 yeah, yeah. and uh and that was it mm -hmm. I had tuner and those three it's like that, that into an AC30 you get the sound of the AC30 you need to push it a little bit yeah, beautiful and put a 57 in front of it and that's pretty much all you need. like for me if I'm traveling yeah. that's my little pedal board put it in the suitcase and that's it great Perfect. so 
Happy days. Happy days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're all for si- not that it would look like it, but we are all for simplification. Yeah. You know. So, for example, now these are very flashy, boutique, expensive versions of what I'm talking about. But this could be a Boss BD2 Blues driver. This could be a Clon type. Yep. So they're wired up on this True Bypass switcher. Again, don't worry about that. Just if the light's on, the pedal's on. Okay. So without any overdrive. <laughs> Okay, so which pedal is this? This is this one, which is the uh, Chase Bliss Automatone Mark II Pre, which okay. basically does all overdrive, but in an analog way. Like I say, could happily be a Boss BD2 Blues driver. Dan's just turned the reverb down a little bit. Just a bit. Beautiful. That sounds great. Nice. Nice long reverb basic, pedal there too. Yeah, yeah <laughs> nice basic. And if Dan, Part of the way through playing, you'll turn on the juggler, which is currently set up just to be um, like a cleaner boost kind of thing. And you'll hear it get louder. And this would be if you're going from a like a rhythm sort of situation to having to play a solo, maybe. So that is hitting the amp harder, of course, mm-hmm. right? So it's getting so you're getting more amp breakup from that as well. I mean, it's adding the character of the pedal, but also when you're ch- chaining the two, uh, cascading from one pedal to the next into that the ecosystem. So the amp's just on the edge. So yeah, you get a little extra harmonics. The amp goes into a little overdrive as well, and it's kind of interesting around that whole pedal distortion versus amp distortion. And our answer is. All the distortion. Yeah, yeah. You know, you want everything harmonically yeah. working together. And they don't work the same. The amp distortion would never be exactly what the no. pedals yeah. into the amp would be. They just they just don't work together because that is adding EQ. It's adding a, a certain gain structure to it. It's pushing the amp in a different way yeah. because it's getting more input yeah, into it. the front end of the amp. Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll just get down to play for a sec. Do you want to play this or you tell you? Oh, good. Tell um, just to, when the question about... Um, you know, basic board setup, what would yeah. that be? I'll turn those things on and we get a listen, we get a listen to that. So what I'll be turning on is a little bit of overdrive. We'll be using delay from here. Mm-hmm. We'll be using reverb from the CXM and we'll be using harmonic tremolo from one of these. And I'll just, I'll build that up as we go. Okay, cool. <laughs>
So we have to just turn on everything. I, just, <laughs> I, I love the power of that, you know, having a, an amp that's got some push to it like that. That's yeah. like loud and sounds super full. And it's really nothing like it. That's it. It, there is nothing like no. it. Yeah, nothing like it. And the way that the guitar, that you have to control the guitar and, and the interaction between the two is everything. It, yeah. yeah. And I think one of the things that we love about Experience Day is when we get players along who have never experienced that, never experienced playing loud. Because of that, it is such a symbiotic relationship, you know. And yes, all the players that we love that you know we, we were listening to growing up they developed that connection yes, that's right you know I've, I've someone posted some old eddie van halen the other day and it's like that guy he was so flipping dynamic with what he did oh my god and he yes. would he would tell a story through the, and it's like oh okay and and i think a lot of the you know they're amazing players but and they'll play it at this level all the time but when you, when you hear those those masters and just take him on this journey, it's like, yeah, yeah. And that's what that gives you. Amazing. So um, I got a call um, a picture. from uh, Neil Finn. He was, they were going on tour. Yep. And they were short of Memory Man. Okay. Right? So I lent him my Memory Man. Yep. And I said, um, and this is when they're doing the family band. And I said, yeah, great. I just want... You, I want you to sign it and draw on it, do whatever you want. So anyway, uh, Neil and all the family drew on this memory man. Anyway, we were, Here you go, Hades. we were going to interview Neil mm -hmm. and he, he was out here with Crowded House that so we formed, uh, as you know, um, mm -hmm. and on the way to the gig, we drove past Stonehenge <laughs> and we do the gag. Do the gag. Do the gag. As a film, it's like, you know, are oh, we doing Stonehenge? No, we're not. So this is a Spinal Tap reference if you don't get it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we went and interviewed Neil and mm -hmm. it was wonderful. Magic. Just. He's awesome. Oh, man. He's so great. And he's yes. like, he's my favorite musician. You know, he's a massive hero of mine. He's been very, very kind and generous with this time. And they're just, the whole family, just beautiful people. Anyway, we've done the interview. We're sitting in a restaurant uh, in Camden. Mm -hmm. And my wife goes, that's David St. Hubbins. Hang on. As it's walking past, it's like, no, it was Michael McKean. It was actually Michael McKean. Walked past us. So we went no way. We chased him. No way. We chased him out of the restaurant. We'll put the phone in now. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you the photos. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. But he was. There he is. Yeah. Justin. We did the same little human. And as we said, look, we're massive fans it's, and we, we, we quote, is, it's crazy. It's impossible. So, yeah, and yeah, we, yeah. Quote, we, we quote Spinal Tap references every day and he goes, and I don't get a penny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was just wonderful. So there we go. Yeah, My yeah. God. Well, guys, this has been incredible. Oh, um, mate. Thank you so much. It's been a, thank you so much for coming here. It's, yeah. a, big, oh, it's a big it's, deal to us. Yeah, it's uh, really been, been my, my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is really, really great. That was, uh, Always welcome. I will never forget that story. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys.